Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, coming here today. And thanks to the panel for uh, joining us. So we have uh, a very exciting uh, discussion today uh, about uh, immunotherapy. In particular, uh, we'll be focusing mostly on checkpoint uh, blockade. Uh, and we have a wonderful set of panelists today. We have uh, Thomas Daniel from Celgene, uh, Glenn Dranoff from Novartis, uh, Bob Mulroy from Merrimack, We've got David Reese from uh, Amgen, uh, Scott Rodig from uh, the Brigham, and Arlene Sharp uh, from Harvard and Brigham and DFCI. And so uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, and so what we're going to do today is uh, uh, cover some of the burning uh, questions in immunotherapy. Uh, and in particular, what uh, we're all impressed by is, as was mentioned in the previous talk, the enormous amount of uh, capital and energy going into cancer immunotherapy right now. And the questions are, uh, you know, is it, is it going in, in an efficient direction? Uh, where are we going with immunotherapy? What are the challenges that we have ahead? What areas of ignorance are we uh, most concerned about uh, as we move forward? And so uh, we're going to cover some of these issues today. Um, but we're going to start uh, with a couple of minute introduction uh, to the field just for those who uh, are not uh, in this area of, of immunology. Uh, just a couple of minutes from Arlene Sharp, who's uh, one of the early discoverers of uh, both the CTLA-4 and PD-1 uh, pathways. And so I think there's no better person to give the background for why this field exists. So, okay, well, Thank you very much, Nir. As you've said, this is truly a very extraordinary and exciting time in the field of cancer immunology and immunotherapy. And one of the things that's different now is that we're beginning to appreciate that the cancer microenvironment, that the tumor microenvironment has many layers of immunosuppression. Tumors evolve to evade attack and eradication by the immune system. And so the principle of checkpoint blockade is to block these pathways that tumors are using to inhibit their eradication. As a result of this, one can then harness the immune system to kill tumors. I'll illustrate this point using the PD-1 pathway, which as you know is a very promising immunotherapeutic at this point. The PD-1 receptor is upregulated on T cells in the tumor microenvironment. And the ligands for PD-1, PD-L1, and PD-L2 can be expressed on tumor cells themselves, as well as immune cells and stromal cells within the tumor. When PD-1 is engaged by its ligands on the T cells, those T cells cannot respond. Those T cells cannot proliferate and unleash cytokines or cytotoxic activity that can contribute to anti-tumor immunity. However, by blocking interactions between PD-1 and its ligands using anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1-L1, one can relieve this suppression and allow these T cells then to attack the tumor. What we're learning is that PD-1 is only a number of these checkpoints. T cells in the tumor microenvironment can co-express multiple of these inhibitory receptors, leading to great interest now in combination therapy using checkpoints, as well as other types of modalities to block PD-1 and other immunosuppressive factors. Great. Thanks, Arlene. So uh, what we want to do now is step back and uh, take a broader view of, of this area and hear from the different voices uh, in our panel for the perspectives on some of the issues. So what I'd like to start with is the really the most obvious uh, burning question, which is uh, given the large number of uh, uh, therapeutics against uh, PD-1 or against CTLA-4 that are being developed by many companies, it's not uh, just a couple of companies, at least uh, 10, um, <coughs> What, what are, and the amount of investment and the number of trials going into it, the, the question that I think uh, we need to deal, deal with is where are these check, checkpoint blockades uh, that we see right now in the market going? Will they live up to their expectations? Will they uh, expand into further cancers? What are the issues that will drive that happening? 
And so the question I wanted to um, start with, uh, with the panel, is to think a little bit more about uh, what are the expectations for uh, the checkpoint blockade, and are they going to live up to them, and what are some of the directions that need to be taken? Um, and we'll come back to combination therapies specifically later, but let's just think about them as they are right now. What, what are the limits? Where are they going? How far can they go? So uh, anyone can uh, take this up. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I think one view is that we've gone through the first wave uh, of experimentation in the clinic with these agents. Um, they clearly have monotherapy activity now in a growing number of diseases. Uh, but one thing that we can't forget is that even in some of the most immunogenic tumors, it's often no more than 50% of patients who will actually respond to the agents, uh, and often it's more like a quarter. So to me, one of the key next questions, perhaps the fundamental question in the field, is what are those dis determinants of response and resistance? Uh, and understanding that really should lead us to the next wave of therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, what I would say is I, I think what everyone in the industry is tremendously excited about a new tool, a new weapon in this, in this battle. Um, but there are certainly times where I feel like the, 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 the potential for this um, is a little bit overplayed, that we always have to remember that cancer is a multifaceted, dynamic state of a cell. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a linear one switch on, one switch off. And so everything we do has a response, right? It's like whack-a-mole. Once we push here, it's going to respond in certain ways. And so, um, you know, I think the, the idea of biomarkers for uh, PD-1 and all these others are a great first step and helpful, but also understanding, uh, you know, that there's diverse immune cell content, diverse states of immune cell potential activation in these tumors. Mm -hmm. There's sort of the next wave of understanding not only who exactly to treat, but how to make rational combinations. Right now, a little bit of the concern I have is that we're, we're sort of trying everything in combination right now, um, but without a really great sense of mechanistically how things will play out in these dynamic states of the cell. Mm -hmm. I think I can just pick up on that. The, um, you, you mentioned, Nir, that, that there may be 10 or more companies that are playing. One of the challenges that um, each pharmaceutical company faces is how do you uh, deploy combination therapies in context of standards of care yeah. in specific diseases. And it's, it's very likely that um, there are some combinations that will amplify mm -hmm. and extend the first the cohort of patients that respond, and secondly, the durability of that response. Mm -hmm. But I think there are also likely standards of care that may prejudice against response Mm -hmm. and, and each of the companies is sort of challenged to anchor their existing pipeline in context with the new agents and understand you know, where are the meaningful opportunities for therapeutic benefit. And, and, and that's not really a simple algorithm f to be sorted out. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, I, 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 I sort of share Bob's point, I think that there is heightened enthusiasm right now because of dramatic responses in melanoma and lung cancer and, and in settings where um, there was little hope um, until this emerged. In the same regard, there are tumor contexts like colon cancer in which we're just now starting to uncover what the determinants of response might be around genomic instability, or markers that would predict, you know, which patients would benefit. So, you know, like most emergent waves of, of enthusiasm in oncology, um, we're at a sort of an early stage, uh, high enthusiasm. Um, there's some attenuation of that enthusiasm, as I'm sure we'll talk about later in the, the panel. But in the end, our anchoring the combination regimens that will deliver high value really needs to be anchored around biological hypotheses that could be tested in individual patients. And I think that's one of the big challenges that we face in sort of deploying this out to its best application. 
but I'd be interested in other panel members, one in particular. I, I, you know, I can agree, so I'm, I'm a pathologist, so I don't treat patients, but I diagnose cancer, and so very firm believer in, in the details of the tissue biopsy is, is extremely important and will be important in, in the context of what are the rational combinations to go forward. So the success of CTLA-4 blockade and PD-1 blockade, of course, has unleashed an enormous amount of drug development. And so almost every checkpoint that's ever been discovered now has a therapeutic coming down, down the pike. So the question is, what are the rational combinations? Um, how can you avoid given patients combinations that'll, you know, that'll cause excessive uh, toxicity? So I think, again, as we've already said, you know, really learning and discovering the biological basis of response or resistance is, is really a, a critical next, uh, next juncture here. And, and I think also in the context of individual tumors, it's going to be extremely important. Um, I've certainly had the privilege to work on classical Hodgkin lymphoma, which has turned out to be an incredibly fruitful uh, approach to looking at PD-1 blockade and, and, and um, because there's a genetic basis for it. It's a disease which I don't think was on any drug company's clinical radar uh, when PD-1 came along uh, because it has a relatively high cure rate with conventional chemotherapy and it's just not that common compared to lung cancer and melanoma. But uh, because there is a strong biological rationale behind it, it proved to be something that, that was a useful clinical trial to move forward in and has worked really extremely well in that context. So using the biological information and the scientific basis for, for designing trials, even in particular tumors that may not have a large market value but could have really a lot of educational value, I think is really important going forward as well. What do people think of the <clears throat> importance then of having the biomarker as part of the, uh, of the uh, therapy or not, since we now know that there are Merck and BMS uh, split on, on this point? It'd be interesting to hear your views. I guess, Scott, you Yeah, I, I don't know that you can maybe. overstate the importance uh, of having a biomarker. And if you think, let's say there are roughly 50 drugs in development in immuno-oncology, the number of combinations is then 49 factorial, which far exceeds the number of patients available uh, to examine. So w without a rational basis for actually attacking the appropriate combinations, mm -hmm. we don't have a chance. Um, I can tell you that in our drug development programs, we build in a very intensive biomarker component, even starting a few years before uh, we anticipate reaching the clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and with um, uh, a drug like Imlogic, the oncolytic uh, herpes simplex virus, um, we have a, a dedicated biomarker study with intensive serial biopsies uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then extensive biomarker analyses with academic collaborators to really try to understand how that evolves over time, uh, again, with the ultimate goal being how do you then improve on the results that you're seeing. So you're, you're still developing the biomarker at this point and hoping to do a trial with it? Is that the idea? Uh, exactly. I mean, the ultimate goal would be to develop some sort of signature or predictor of yep. response and resistance and then use that to select patients. Right. I mean, Glenn? Well, you know, I, I think the pace of activity that uh, we're uh, all witnessing now is remarkable. But it's important to put it in the perspective of how we got to uh, the, the place that we're uh, currently in. And uh, the importance of the immune checkpoint blockade with CTLA-4 and that PD-1, I think really uh, its, its major impact is, it, is how it established definitively that immunity mattered uh, to cancer. There had been 100 years of uh, studies around different aspects of the host response to cancer, but there wasn't really definitive evidence that uh, 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 manipulation of endogenous immunity was therapeutic. And so what has happened with that demonstration now is that decades of uh, basic uh, research into how the immune system works is now potentially applicable 
uh, to uh, the cancer problem. And I don't think it's by chance that there are many, many different uh, immunologic approaches that are being tested, because those are all based upon solid understanding of how immune responses develop uh, in other contexts. And the issue is uh, how will those general principles apply to uh, cancer? So biomarkers is really a term here that I think more in terms of uh, you know, what are the mechanisms of protective tumor immunity. And the more that you learn about those specific pathways and how the unique interactions with different tumors play out, then one will be able to uh, explore accommodations in a much more uh, informed way. And uh, it isn't a matter of just needing to test all the permutations. There are some basic principles that need to be established and find out uh, how, how broadly applicable they are across tumor types. Arlene, can I ask you? Sure, I just wanted yeah, to add to that. You know, I think that another layer of discovery is going to be very helpful here. A lot of our understanding of CTLA-4 and PD-1 came from an understanding of tolerance. Essentially, tumors are exploiting tolerance pathways. Now that we're beginning to understand the different inhibitory molecules, we really need to probe each microenvironment not all tumors are the same. Tumors are heterogeneous, in their, as has already been mentioned. But if one thinks about transplantation, it's easier to transplant a liver than it is the skin, many different principles. So I think there's great value into understanding each tumor in it, within its microenvironment and developing, if you will, a tumor immunity atlas that then we can use as a reference point that then we can use to understand new mechanisms, cell types that we probably don't even know exist. And that can help us understand mechanisms, also predict what types of combinations be used, and then layer on an understanding of resistance mechanisms. I mean, from one point of view, we've actually doubled the universe of problems that we have. Mm -hmm. you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we thought if we understood the tumor thoroughly on a molecular level, that would tell us what to do. Now we know we have to understand the tumor and the host, the host side, and that is still in its infancy, I would submit. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to ask Arlene specifically, but anyone else as well. <clears throat> Besides, um, you know, special cases like Hodgkin's where you have this amplification, are there other cancers that uh, we should be thinking about for checkpoint blockade that have some special properties? Or um, are there additional checkpoints that will be potentially dominant in some tumors or tissues versus others? And, and that was kind of the most scientific question, technical question, I think we'll get to in this question, but you know, are there specific things that, that are gonna be coming up uh, in particular tumors with these checkpoints or with new checkpoints in other tumors? So, so I mean, certainly, you know, within the context of the spectrum of human cancer types, of which there are thousands of different types of, of cancer you can get. So, you know, the answer is yes, there are unique properties to each of them, which is why they're defined differently. And it's been recognized for a long time, many of them you know, elicit an inflammatory response. Yeah. By and large, from a diagnostic standpoint, that has been ignored. Um, you know, and the focus has been on the context of defining the tumor type based on its, its cellular uh, cell of origin. But that's obviously changing. And, some, and so many, uh, you know, many tumors, um, you know, MSI high colon cancer, for instance, are often associated with a very high lymphocytic infiltrate. Certain types of lymphoma are as well. I think, you know, we're now going back and re-examining these. Is that an indication that these may be specific tumor types in patient populations that are, that have an incipient but suppressed anti-tumor immune response that we can then unleash with these appropriate therapies? So I think it's, Again, it's a reassessment of the entire field that's going on now, and I think in the context of each of the new checkpoint inhibitors that come through, it'll have to be assessed in that context. I think what I see is that there's um, some early research going on both academically and some biotechs that are looking across all indications for trying to develop diagnostics that are specific to immune cell content and uh, potential for immune cell activation in those tumors. That, that may throw this idea out, uh, as Scott was saying, of you have pancreatic or 
colon cancer, it may say you've, you've got a, you know, potential PD-1 you know, optimized cancer or something like that. But that, that the diagnostics that are specific for this field um, may cut across cancers in a way we haven't seen before um, based on some of the early work that, that seems to be coming, that the, that potential and that, uh, that the activations seem to be an independent variable to cancer. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, talking about the diagnostic platforms as well, too, I mean, I think mm -hmm. I, I, the way I'm thinking about it now based on some of the work from, from the lung cancer <laughs> trials is that, you know, I think you really need to think about almost these things as split components. I mean, a lot of the biomarker development and assays that are companions for the clinical trials are essential for the understanding and the interpretation of the, of the trial results because we just don't know all the mechanisms that are going on yet. But there's an additional step, obviously, that, that pharmaceutical companies are interested in, and that's the diagnostic as a you know, commercial entity or enterprise. And that's basically an almost an entirely different subject, um, being able to push forward a companion diagnostic for your drug or for your medication has many different aspects um, that, that are outside of the traditional sort of research or investigational use. Um, now you're talking about implementing something in a clinical laboratory that has to work day in and day out, have fast turnaround time, work on all tumor types or all sample types, and it, it is in, in a sense, more of an, a very different concept. Um, and so a lot of what I think we're doing currently is still in that let's try to understand what's going on with these clinical trials aspects. And it's critical to understand it, to have these biopsies taken as part of the trials, analyzing the tissue in a, in a rational manner with good reagents. But I still think we're a little bit early in terms of this idea of, okay, there's this gonna be this FDA approved kit that's manufactured by one or two companies that everyone is going to use. It may eventually occur, but to my viewpoint, it's still a little bit premature. That's a difficult problem. Well, one challenge with uh, diagnostics in this field <clears throat> is actually the evolution of that microenvironment over right. time. And, you know, so for, for example, we know that after treatment with bispecific T cell engaging antibodies, many tumors will upregulate the PD1, PDL1 axis. That actually forms the basis for a combination therapy there. But a snapshot at diagnosis of that microenvironment is going to look very different than one under the pressure of various therapies. And we need yeah. to grapple with how we're actually going to sort that out. So it's not only what is the diagnostic, but it's when is the diagnostic. Yes. Now, I would agree that temporal analyses are very important here to really understand the environment before and after immune modulation. And looking at the environment before can also be very informative as to what you need to do. For example, if there's no immune infiltrate, then your strategy may be different. You may think that you need to do something to provoke an immune response using a vaccine, engineered T cells, some other strategy. And that's another area that we really need to understand to think about what are the, what are the steps that are defective? Why are there not an immune response here? is that there are no immune cells existing, they can't traffic to the microenvironment, they're being inhibited to do so, or the local microenvironment is suppressive. So understanding this on multiple levels is going to be important for therapeutics. Mm -hmm. Well, that, so we, we will come back to combination therapy later because that is such a big topic, although we covered a lot of the issues. I wanted to take a break from this topic and talk about the toxicities for a moment, which is something that we, um, uh, isn't talked about quite as much because there's so much excitement about things that are working. Um, so what, what, just f what are the most important um, checkpoint uh, side effects that we should be uh, thinking about and when, when we combine the checkpoints as well? And how um, should we be dealing with those as we go forward? What, what should we do about them? How should we monitor them? Well, it's not surprising that <clears throat> the um Common side effects are those that uh, attend immune activation. Yeah. So in effect, uh, the target organs that are involved in autoimmunity are also targeted as side effects 
from the immune activation therapies. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the skin with rashes, the gut, um, uh, the liver, um, endocrine organs, um, and in some cases, uh, the CNS and some other tissues, rare, rare examples. Um, there are, I think, uh, reasonably established clinical guidelines for trying to mitigate toxicities in patients who are on these drugs. Um, obviously, the downside of that is that you are undoubtedly putting at risk the beneficial effect, mm -hmm. just as you do with um, um, marrow transplantation and dealing with graft versus host disease in yeah. context. So. There is a sort of teetering balance uh, required to, to get this right, and um, and in, in in there are in fact explicit differences between, for example, ipilimumab and the PD-1 agents, mm -hmm. with ipi being a bit more toxic um, in both prevalence and sometimes in severity. Um, these same issues will play out not only in uh, the cancer immunotherapies we're speaking about here today, but also in the CAR T. Uh, discussions of tomorrow. So, so those are the sort of, that's the framing. What do you do about it? Clinically, you mitigate in order to sort of balance uh, safety and efficacy in an individual patient. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I think if we're to deploy this therapeutic approach to its greatest value, we're going to have to understand how to mitigate safety in earlier disease and at levels that are uh, tolerable for either long-term or protracted use. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the big sort of, you know, barriers in the field, and will probably ultimately define um, features of how broadly the therapies can be applied. Yeah, I think the, the issue of toxicity highlights uh, two major aspects of what immunotherapy has in its uh, promise. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is selectivity and potentially being able to uh, recognize tumor cells, the specific differences that uh, make cancer cells uh, separate from healthy tissues, mm -hmm. um, and the issue of memory, uh, which uh, would, if properly engaged, uh, imply the ability to deploy therapeutics only for a finite period of time. So um, the current approaches uh, uh, still have lots of room, I would say, for achieving greater selectivity for uh, tumors over compromising the homeostatic immune mechanisms that our lead uh, referred to as tolerance that maintain uh, uh, tissue uh, 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 health. Mm -hmm. So uh, the more that we understand about engaging the uh, adaptive immune system uh, focused on uh, cancer-specific alterations, the better our therapeutic index will be. Uh, well, since, since we'll come back to vaccines later anyway, do you want to just do it now? And you know, in that context, is that going to increase specificity? Is that a, a path? Or are there other paths to, to increase specificity? And anyone can comment. Glenn, you want to start? Well, if you define vaccines in a broad sense okay. of uh, a mechanism that involves capture of tumor antigens by uh, dendritic cells and uh, the dendritic cells converting that uh, 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 material into a form that's then capable of, it, of stimulating an adaptive immune response. Uh, if that's the concept of a vaccine, then surely um, improving that process is going to uh, enhance uh, selectivity. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the challenge is how do you do that? Uh, uh, does it require something that actually is called a vaccine? Right. Uh, can there be uh, uh, therapeutic interventions that unleash the dendritic cell uh, in a way that it can function more appropriately. Uh, so this is a very broad area of investigation. And as you know, uh, vaccines have been studied for quite some time and for the most part have 
not demonstrated significant clinical benefits uh, that could either reflect an intrinsic limitation of a vaccine concept, mm -hmm. or it could reflect uh, the need to couple vaccines with other immunomodulatory uh, approaches that deal with uh, uh, suppressive circuitry. So mm -hmm. this is a major area that most people are exploring, and data will be emerging in a, on a mm -hmm. regular basis to help clarify. So going beyond vaccines, are there other approaches? And do you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, so I, first of all, I guess it depends on how you define vaccine. Yep. Um, you know, we can go beyond vaccine. It's so whatever is needed. Go beyond specific. vaccines. Again, I would return to you know the oncolytic virus, mm -hmm. uh, you know platform, for example. In theory, injection of the oncolytic virus, its replication, lysis of tumor cells should unleash a, a shower of neoantigens, uh, which are taken up by dendritic cells. Uh, that is a way to really try to kickstart uh, the immune. Uh, uh, response, and the, the question then is, are there other things that we can do to really enhance that, such as checkpoint mm -hmm. blockade administered at the same time? And, and we think there's a tremendous promise uh, in this sort of approach. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to think about that type of combination, because one of the reasons why these vaccines may not work is that they're, we're trying to stimulate things in this whole environment of immunosuppression and early work in the area of therapeutic vaccines and viral models showed that the vaccines themselves didn't work, but then when you combine them with PD-1, there was a potent synergy suggesting that such a combination could be important. Right, so ultimately the toxicity question may be answered by the next wave of combinations or therapies rather than dealing with the toxicity itself, because that's something that you know, people haven't done a lot to try to understand the toxicity, how it works, and trying to target it. That, as you said, there's a general way to do it, but those might suppress uh, the response you want as well. And so there may not be an easy way to do it. Right, now, now one advantage is that the, the vaccines or oncolytic viruses, at least that have been studied to date, generally have relatively favorable safety profiles, right. which is very important when thinking about combinability. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is just a general question. Why, why do we think that CTLA-4 and PD-1 therapies are so different in their toxicity? I don't know if Arlene wants to take <laughs> that one. Well, I think when we think about how they're important in an immune response, CTLA-4 seems to be very important at, er at early stages in priming. Years ago, we made a mouse that lacked CTLA-4. Those mice don't survive. They die of an autoimmune disease, which first pointed to an important role for CTLA-4 as an inhibitory molecule in intolerance. Mm -hmm. When we went on to make mice that lacked PD-1 or its ligands, those mice don't develop spontaneous fatal autoimmune disease, suggesting that there are upstream and downstream components, that there are multiple pathways, multiple tiers of regulation. I think CTLA-4 is one that's more proximal. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one question that has come up a lot, and already we got an audience question on, is the relationship between this and the, the huge wave of targeted therapies and also traditional uh, therapies. I don't know if any of you are thinking specifically about that in your own work, if, if you know, you're, you're wonder, doing something about that and would want to comment on that question. I don't know if any you want to take it. Well, I mean, um, there's extraordinary opportunities for uh, learning about how to best integrate targeted therapies and uh, immunotherapies. Mm -hmm. The first point uh, is that while targeted therapies may initially have been developed with a tumor cell autonomous application in mind, there is enormous overlap. Uh, in the pathways that uh, cancers use to promote their own uh, progression and ones that the immune system uses. When you think about uh, the response to viral infection, for example, uh, T cells may uh, it increase in numbers on the order of 10 to the many logs, 10 to the fifth in many cases. So an enormous replicative capacity uh, and then that uh, capacity has to be countered and those cells 
uh, undergo, for the most part, programmed cell death with, with uh, some remaining as uh, memory cells. But that dynamic in and of itself tells you that there's going to be enormous overlap between immune responses and, and cancer uh, cells in their wiring. So there is a world uh, to be discovered, I think, in terms of looking very precisely and in detail at what the impact of targeted therapies are on the <clears throat> immune response per se. There's been really very, uh, only a modest amount of work in that area. So uh, the more that one can then learn about uh, the impact of the targeted therapy on uh, the host response, then the better uh, position one will be in, in terms of crafting how you integrate targeted therapies and immunotherapies, because there are surprises. Already, the, uh, the lessons from combining uh, BRAF inhibitors with checkpoint blockade uh, revealed unexpected enhancement of inflammatory toxicity. Um, and that, in part, gave rise to the recognition of how uh, there was this paradoxical MAP kinase activation that could occur with uh, BRAF inhibitors. <clears throat> so I think this is just one beginning example of a, a large uh, uh, activity that's likely to be quite productive. Right. So uh, the sort of interaction between the, the immune system and uh, the mechanisms driving the cancer yeah. in the old-fashioned way we thought about cancer is one of the areas that we've pushed into. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's amazingly complex. Yeah. But, I, but I think the potential is there, um, as you're saying, that understanding those specific interactions, I mean, we see that, you know, the types of pathways that, are, that might be driving cell growth, whether it's IGF or EGFR, will influence the immune activation state. And so these pathways mm -hmm. of all these different components, sometimes we, th we think of them as separate parts, but they're actually interconnected. And so this evolution of the microenvironment is, is, is driving the evolution of the tumor. The evolution of the tumor, in part, is altering the microenvironment. Mm -hmm. And it's that interaction that we focused in, and the number of layers and complexities are there. But down the road, uh, there, there are certainly going to be homogeneous tumors um, that are going to respond to sort of single class therapies. Mm -hmm. our, our, our research suggests that that's not the majority, that's the minority, whatever that number may be, 40, 50%, that the majority are going to need sort of multiple types of therapies, multiple modalities to either activate the immune system uh, or to take care of uh, uh, sort of pathway responses to immune therapy checkpoint or something like that mm -hmm. at different points down the road. But it is, it is certainly where I think this field needs to go mm -hmm. in terms of this base understanding of of these interactive mechanisms mm -hmm. between the microenvironment and the, and the tumor. One of our challenges will be to resist the impulse <clears throat> to regard everything as an immunotherapy. Yeah. Cast your mind back 15 years. Everything started as a cytotoxic and then became an anti-angiogenic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and now, actually, some of the same drugs that started as a cytotoxic and became an anti-angiogenic are now immunomodulatory agents. <laughs> uh, and so I'm not, I'm not sure where the truth lies, but uh, you know, it lies in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are going to have to be very rigorous in how we approach these problems, because it's also very easy to tell yourself stories uh, about how you're affecting immune modulation. Yeah. But Just to add to that, there are a lot of great <laughs> classes of therapies that are showing fantastic results that are not related to immunotherapy out now there right. in the world that seem to be a little bit forgotten, that have been paths of research that have gone on for decades that are showing exciting things uh, in colorectal or, or small cell where immune uh, therapy hasn't really shown much promise yet. But I also think, uh, picking up on a point that Glenn raised, that some of these therapies, like targeted therapies, do have effects on the immune system. They can initially lead to a response during transition to resistance. You can see upregulation of PDL1. So I think there's great value in thinking about all therapies, conventional therapies, radiation, chemotherapy, what they do to the immune system. So then one can think about combinations that are rational or irrational that as one moves forward, we need to really understand the impact of different types of therapies on the immune system. It's not a null event. Yeah. Just to add to that complexity, the panel earlier this morning addressed epigenetic targets. And um, one of the, <clears throat> I guess, promising hypotheses is that 
modifying epigenetic targets could change the tumor's representation of surface antigens. But that's complex because in the same way, uh, the immune system may be modulated by the same epigenetic targeting activity. So the, the, uh, it's not a simple no. problem, actually. No. So it's, I mean, it sounds like we're, in a way, very optimistic about the possibilities, but the combinatorial space there is large and complex as much as the immunotherapy cross immunotherapy spaces. So we've got these competing, you know, also in terms of practicality, uh, agendas <laughs> and may be difficult to, to move forward all of them simultaneously, ultimately. I think we're also seeing that regulatory agencies are increasingly sensitive to in the situation that you mentioned, <clears throat> where uh, an unexpected te toxicity may emerge in context of uh, um, a PD-1 checkpoint with, you know, a, a targeted mech or, or uh, you know, ERK inhibitor, and so if, if or RAF, um, so if we, if we don't um, anticipate the potential for toxicities, we, we may actually find ourselves um, um, struggling with the agencies to have to do combitox studies in anticipation of doing clinical trials, um, and this is a you know, something that we need to get a bit of a head on, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you touched on biomarkers earlier. When you think about the number of combinatorial possible combinations, it's, it's infinite, right? And so, uh, you know, biomarkers are not uh, uh, a maybe anymore. If you just even want to execute a clinical study, if you don't know who you can treat or specifically who to treat among, uh, you know, what is an amazing competition for global cancer patients, uh, it'd be difficult to even just practically execute your study. Mm -hmm. um, so it's critically mechanistically to get the response you want, but practically it's important to even negotiate the path uh, of, of moving forward and getting proof of concept um, mm -hmm. as just an essential part of, of being in the business. Yeah. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see if, you know, all these, you know, even five years ago, you know, doing, doing biopsies in the context of clinical trials was, was not that common, right? And, you know, we, you know, I would if I went to one of these meetings, I'd be like the only pathologist in the room. So, so things have changed tremendously in that you know I think most of the companies now have bought into the idea that um, having you know pre-treatment, non-treatment biopsies is is really essential for an understanding of what's going on. And as we've alluded to multiple times, these systems are so complex, and when you get into com combinor combinatorial drugs, it's going to get even more complex, so it's, it's a critical, critical aspect to all, to the understanding of these things. And I wonder if the regulatory agencies are also going to start demanding it. I mean, I think you know, the FDA and the NIH, you know, by and large have not paid as much attention to biomarkers and, and biopsy samples in these contexts, but I think that's, that thought process is really changing as well. Um, that if you're going to do this to patients, you know, we, we need to understand what's happening to them at the mechanistic level. In order but, but also because, as was said before, if different checkpoints work on different patients and different tumors, it, it is going to be a little bit crazy to have large trials for every different, it's impossible actually to have large trials for each combination. It's going to be, have to be very focused. But I think that raises another important point, which is one pressing need I see is the is our need to develop new surrogates for response. Mm -hmm. um, traditional response criteria are, are not wholly adequate for assessing uh, a lot of these drugs, uh, and certainly there, you know, the, the phenomenon of pseudo-progression where a tumor is getting larger before it actually mm -hmm. uh, responds is quite real. We've seen that in the clinic. Um, are there ways that we can develop surrogates that allow us to have a, an early readout from these trials without the very prolonged studies, given the number of potential combinations. Well, I mean, your point is great because, of course, survival has been the, the most important, in a way, of the outcomes. And that takes, as we see, many years after the trials begin. And so the, I don't think there has been that much progress, actually, in what you're right. suggesting. No, that's why I would lay it out as a major challenge for the field. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, overall survival will become increasingly difficult because these patients are living much, much longer, you know, which is a great thing, of course, but it makes certain trials almost intractable. Yeah. So how does it affect overall strategy of the whole business uh, 
and the market um, these discussions? Because, I mean, obviously everyone is going as quickly as possible forward and hoping for the best. <laughs> but what, what is the actual impact of, of what we're talking about now on how many studies, how many drugs are going to be testable, how many combinations, whether we're just going to have a lot of false uh, results and false starts and, you know, in, impossible trials and I think these have to confusion. develop hand in hand. I mean, they have to develop <laughs> hand in hand. And, you know, that's, that's why there is so much interest in the new biomarkers. And, and I think even as you've alluded to, you know, it may not even be a tissue biomarker, maybe a serum biomarker or something of some type of immune, anti-tumor immune response that's occurring in a patient. And, you know, I think maybe, you know, Glenn may, may have some comments on this, but, you know, with the traditional criteria of radiologic response, which now people realize probably is flawed in the context of, of immune trials, you know, there's probably quite a few patients that were pulled off trials, pulled off drugs, who probably were going to have a response, but they were misinterpreted as having progressive disease under yeah. traditional criteria. So, yes, response criteria have to be redefined and is a critical issue. So, so those of you who are driving trials forward, what, what, what makes you worry about the feasibility here? And how are you dealing with it? Well, there, there seem to be two strategies in the world. The, the one is try everything. And there are certainly companies out there. There's one out there with 100 combination studies underway. Right. Uh, and then there's the let's figure it out strategy. Let's see if we can get the marker in the right patient strategy. Mm -hmm. um, we're in that camp. <laughs> sure. Because I, I just uh, I think the variability patient to patient, tumor to tumor, um, as we've talked about, is so high that that sort of do-it-all strategy is likely to have uh, yeah. not great outcomes. Um, but <clears throat> you're back to what are you measuring in immune state, in immune activation, in interaction with other potential combinations that is the central question of how do you do that smartly. Um, but I think that's where the field's going to take the biggest step forward in the next few years because there's, I, I think most companies are doing that, but mm -hmm. not everybody. The, the, the question is with, you know, you, you've doubled the number of cancer trials underway with this class of therapies uh, in such a short time. You've, you've got to quickly figure out how you negotiate that space with your hopefully smarter attempt uh, a little bit later. Right. I think there may be a convergence of three um, uh, lenses required to avoid the shotgun approach that Bob just mentioned. Um, the first is to think carefully about the patient context in which mm -hmm. these drugs and combinations are medically valuable because that you have to be meeting an unmet need at this stage of the emergent therapy. Yep. Um, the second principle is that the um, scientific grounding for why a combination makes some sense mm -hmm. with, as, as um, others were mentioning, biomarkers to illustrate that you are interrogating that question in small cohorts of well-studied patients, I think is arguably um, a much more tractable and financially feasible approach than mm -hmm. um, large shotgun trials. And then the, the third point is that we, we are at a very early stage of understanding um, some issues that you're addressing in your lab here, which have to do with the clonal diversity um, represented in a given patient in their disease. And until we start to frame the host and tumor context correctly, I think that we're, we're, we're going to struggle. And we, we are at risk, in my view, of, of diluting our effort uh, by distraction and losing great opportunity for subsets of patients who could really benefit. So uh, since we only have uh, less than five minutes left, I wanted to bring up one other topic that we didn't discuss, which is pricing and cost uh, of these um, drugs. And I want to put it in two contexts. One question that was just asked from the audience, which is, should people stop taking some of these therapeutics once you get stable disease? Um, how long should you be taking it? And what, what is going to be the evolution of uh, the pricing uh, given the proliferation of these types of therapies and potentially combinations. 
So maybe we can try to bring together the, the use of the drug, the number of drugs, and the cost issues, and how, how that's going to evolve. You know, my, my view on pricing is that there's really only <coughs> one sensible approach, and that's eventually get to outcomes. <laughs> Um, Eventually, that outcomes, right? Yeah. Is that, you know, uh, there's an enormous public debate about pricing, which is the cost of new therapies. But if, you, if you're inside the industry, you know that, um, you know, pick your number, one out of 50,000 molecules we look at get approved, uh, seven out of 100 put in the clinic for oncology get approved, only two of 10 that it get approved make their money back. I mean, this is an investment industry. 25 cents on every dollar the industry takes in goes back into R&D. Mm -hmm. that, that what drives pricing today is the cost of R&D, mm -hmm. right? And that getting better at R&D is the one thing that's going to change that. That's, that's the only thing that's going to change that. But if the checkpoint that. therapies succeed and produce a lot of income, could the prices go down? Right, but they will. You'll have competition. You'll yeah. have all those good 10 things. 10 PD-1 that, drugs. I don't know. Well, that. Yeah. It, it, and, and they would, but I, I think that the only real measure of, of therapies in the long term is outcomes measurement. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think when you get into sort of questions of value, you get into the trick of actually potentially destroying the, the investment that's going to create those great outcomes in the combinations mm -hmm. we're talking about for all patients, not just the, the minority. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not in, in the industry, so I don't know, but you guys will know better than me, but my understanding is in Europe, you know, there is sort of a, an outcome model anyway. I mean, my understanding is, you know, in the UK, you know, it's, there is a pricing model based on, you know, advanced life years, so how many life years are, are, are granted by, through use of this medication, and that type of uh, analysis goes into what the national healthcare system will actually pay, so, you know, payments may be linked to, to outcomes. I mean, ultimately, increasing the effect size is one of the most effective That's ways way to, go. to create value. If 90% of patients had long-term remissions, the value argument becomes very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. You also ask a question about the, the continuation or discontinuation of yep. therapy. That was one of the, yep. Right. Um, I think we, we may draw a little bit of information from the CAR T. My panelists may disagree, so I'll try to be provocative here. But we may, we may draw a bit of information from the CAR T setting where um, the maintenance of the clone appears to be important in the durability of response. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, one approach, scientific, to understanding whether or not you could discontinue therapy would be around immunophenotyping and understanding the, the durability of the immune response in mm -hmm. context, whether it's from oncolytic virus plus a PD-1 or whatever. You know. And how long do you actually need it for? Right. Well, yeah. I don't know what you think of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, memory is what uh, really will define val value and outcome. Right. You know, a long, long lasting benefit is what everybody wants. and. Uh, uh, you know, from the CAR T cell space, uh, there are data now that uh, go out as long as three years, I believe, uh, that show uh, maintenance of uh, disease controls associated with persistence of the CARs. There's also data, I think this remarkable data from uh, ipilimumab, mm -hmm. where uh, four doses over a few months uh, now we uh, understand can lead to benefits that accrue for as long as 10 years. So memory, however it can be engaged, is, uh, yeah. is the critical. It's a good target at this point. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, I think we're in the last 20 seconds here. So thank you, uh, everyone, for a wonderful panel and for making it clear that you know, what the different arms that are, we're moving forward in, in terms of both biomarkers, combinations. There's obviously an uh, incredible complexity and enormous amount of work to do. So um, I think we should get back. Uh, to work and do it, so <laughs> thanks.